Okay, cool. I, I have to introduce you because I did practice how to say Rosicrucian. Uh, so this is Garrett Scott, talking about Rosicrucian, Barbara Orators, Humanist Doodles, and the Bible Dictionary amid the Cherokee. Okay, so good evening. I am, in fact, Garrett Scott, and I'm an antiquarian bookseller, and I've got a warehouse office in the old bottle garage behind Morgan and York of the old Big Ten Party store. And my title tonight should be considered perhaps as evocative. It's evocative more of the sorts of 18th and 19th century books that I carry. And certainly the five minute limit, when taken with some of the sterner theological dictates I've absorbed from the books I've handled, allows me insufficient time to plumb the depths of the African American barber orator, abolitionist, and spiritualist sex mystic, Hashel Beverly Randolph. Nor to dwell on the Implicit ironies of the Cherokee mission copy of the 1811 Dictionary of the Holy Bible that once passed through my shop, nor on the cold comfort that the Cherokee must have taken in the tales of the lost tribe of Israel. But, but instead, I'm going to talk more about the challenges of the antiquarian book trade in the digital age. Now, the ancient days of bookselling, before about 1994, a bookseller made his money selling a customer the book the customer wanted. That seems a pretty straightforward way to do business. By relying on a combination of interesting or extensive stock, a network of book scouts, auctions, and the regular tides of printed bookseller catalogs that washed across his desk, a bookseller might, from among all of this, locate that title that a customer without these resources might otherwise despair of finding. Now, I'm going to digress just a moment to note that even in these golden days of bookselling, old time Ohio bookseller Ernie Wesson, whose catalogs are up here, he supplemented his income with a patent medicine business. <laughs> and, and he's not the only bookseller to have to do that to make his ends meet. But the 18th century Chapman, Henry LeBoy, also peddled, in addition to his pamphlets, a, a, a nostrum known as bug water, but, which was no doubt, you know, the very name itself, a tonic to the afflicted. But, but to return to the old way of doing things, you know, this was perhaps best embodied by the old trade publication, A.B. Bookman's Weekly, which would publish the occasional article on some bibliographic subject, but whose real meat was in the extensive lists of agate type of books wanted and books offered for sale. A bookseller made his money marking up the prices on items as they passed via AB or other channels through his hands and onto a satisfied customer. Everyone was happy. Until in the early 1990s, some bright person who needed bifocals or something said, can't we get computers to do this? And with the advent of online bookselling, the market grew disgustingly efficient. And, <laughs> and the title of the was gone for $10 in you can now pick up for five bucks the instant the collector even thinks about the title, and all without a middleman. So with the prices of once seemingly uncommon books being driven down across the board to survive in the trade today, a bookseller has to sell the customer the book she doesn't know she wants. Instead of selling titles, you have to sell the story behind the title. And these stories are like formal dance steps. They unfold in a strict progression you take my discovery of a 15th century German book in a stack of books about Chinese art at an auction in Terre Haute, Indiana. And that book had extensive contemporary marginalia, and I sold it to the uh, Beinecke Library's Rosenthal collection. Now, you've got the improbable find in a unlikely location spiced with the minor subterfuge necessary for an auction purchase. And it's an infinitely flexible trope, and it bolsters up any romance of a book purchase. Now, I'll digress to point out that readers' marks in books should be taken perhaps in moderation, <laughs> but they do make a good story. But in telling the stories, as with the ingredients maybe of bug water, it's best not to tell the customer too much. And now I've got plenty of ignorance, so that's not too hard for me. So, you know, it was a, a typical aesthetic or economic impulse that prompted a reader to clothe these simple tracks in these decorative scraps. Open questions leave the customer this promise of discovery uh, that's kind of a tonic for the jaded. Now, sometimes you emphasize this story because it's too familiar. The uh, clergyman in 1844, George Beryl Cheever, delivered a series of lectures on hierarchical despotism, which is, of course, code word for the follies of the Pope. And he fulminated uh, against the blackened page of a New York City school book that was censored by the Catholics. <laughs> it was probably this book, The Sequel to the English Reader, which had an inflammatory story about Martin Luther. And you know, this sparked the Bible riots in Philadelphia of 1844, where the question was, what kind of Bible are we going to use to teach our children in the public schools? And these kind of passions are suggested by the making and the marring of books and make compelling reasons that the physical book and the way the readers react to the book are still relevant today. Now, so where will book selling go once all the texts are digitized and the keyword searches are the norm? You know, there should still be some room for surprising discoveries, compelling stories about the physical book and its readers. 
you know, the once cumbersome process of digging out these stories, you know, we could streamline it. We could get some sort of biblio Pandora that's going to push otherwise unknown books into my lap. And, you know, I don't necessarily relish having sort of a Bloomberg, you know, instead of a Bloomsbury kind of bookshop, but I still hope that I'm going to get those opportunities to tell those stories that give you that chance to look with a wild surmise upon that bibliophilic peak in area. <laughs> Yeah.